Namaskar and good afternoon and a hearty and warm welcome to day three of Taikon Chandigarh 2021. The past two days have been full of exhaustive discussions on various topics from making brands go viral, leveraging the Thai network for funding, the future of edtech, inventing the future and so on and so forth. And today is all about scalability and successfully expanding businesses. And I'm Niharika with you, the official anchor and host for Taikon Chandigarh 2021. Before we move forward, it is important and imperative to acknowledge the contribution of all our sponsors and partners. Hence, in no particular sequence, I would like to acknowledge the contribution of our partner, ISP. I would also like to give thanks to our gold partners, uh, GIZ India and Punjab Technical University. Also, our heartiest gratitude to our silver partners, STPI and Pioneer, and to our bronze partners, Hit Bullseye, Chitkara University, and Nabad. And lastly, how can I forget our platinum sponsors, Government of Punjab and Startup Punjab. And now moving forward with the day's proceedings, ladies and gentlemen. You know, mankind's history goes through several turning points, each one bringing with it a new change. Artificial intelligence, or AI as it is commonly abbreviated, happens to be another such turning point. Now, over the past few years, it has evolved into a powerful tool and is considered as the next significant technological shift. That technological shift is already here and taking shape, and some even argue that it's equivalent to the fourth industrial revolution. And because we are talking about a revolution here, I must take a minute to tell you about Neuron, a center of excellence established at Mohali by STPI Next, a center of excellence that is contributing actively to this new revolution. Neuron's intent and objective stems from a perspective of overall economic and social growth. Now, the ultimate goal of Neuron is to identify and support the entrepreneurs using cutting edge technology with a viable business plan, especially in the fields of artificial intelligence, which is what we are talking about right now, big data, the internet of things and antivirus guard. Now the neuron ecosystem supports the startups with technical assistance and product and solution readiness, along with a managed workspace. I'll tell you more about it, but perhaps now is not the time. That was just a teaser. The entire film is now about to unfold in front of you. Now, let me move on to the first speaker for this afternoon. Our first guest is the co-founder, group chief executive, and vice chairman of Fractal Analytics, an organization involved in providing analytics for Fortune 500 companies and much more. Mathematics, probability, and artificial intelligence are three things his life revolves around, followed by a deep interest in consumer behavior, behavioral economics, and deep learning. Ladies and gentlemen, presenting to you the first session for this afternoon by Mr. Shrikant Bela Makani. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Niharika. I'm going to go uh, share my screen. If, unless you've been living under a rock, you've been seeing tremendous progress and tremendous discussion about AI of late. In this next 15 odd minutes, I'm going to just walk you through answering two questions. Firstly, will AI change the world? And if so, how can you use, your, use AI to grow your business? If in the last few years, you've seen tremendous amounts of progress on AI, You've heard stories about how in image processing and natural language processing and whole, whole new areas of algorithmic decision making, how AI is advancing and getting as good or better than humans. And it's magical. It's a lot of, it is, sounds very magical. But first, I'll unpack that into a few simple examples so that you can understand what's going on. And then we'll see how, whether it will change the world or not. This is a story of a Japanese farmer called Makoto Koike, who's actually an engineer. His parents have been farmers for the last 50 years. He visited them, them in 2014 to see what they have been up to. And um, he realized that uh, his mother was spending way too much time sorting cucumbers coming in her farm. Cucumber is a very interesting crop. It has nine different varieties in the Japanese market. And it is important to sort those cucumbers in those nine varieties, depending on the texture, color, size, length, etc. And because it's a seasonal crop, she was not able to get temporary help. So she was manually doing this work. So Makoto said, I'm an engineer, let me help. 
and he went up, went ahead and used took 5000 pictures of cucumbers and asked his mother to sort of rate them across in those nine categories he then built a tensorflow algorithm and, and then uh, put a system in place that works today right and it was 70% accurate in the first pass this he built in 2015 let's see what happened in that he, this is how the system works as the on the left here you see that on, as cucumbers come through the lot there's a camera that's taking a little camera that's taking a picture of those cucumbers that is getting processed by an, the tensorflow algorithm and that algorithm is basically saying which of those nine categories that cucumber belongs to then based on this recommendation or this decision there is a little controller here which is based built out of raspberry pi 3 and it sort of sorts those cucumber sort of pushes nudges those cucumbers into one of those nine bins that are set out there and over time there's a learning loop to get the algorithm better this is the system he built and it worked very well and you can say you can say so what's the big deal big deal is that it can obviously solve very simple common problems as well but the bigger deal is that all aspects of ai are actually embedded in this process and if you see this is really where ai is beginning to start beginning to contribute to human life right but first is perception can we really take in the world from its five or six or any number of senses that we perceive the world can an algorithm also perceive the world in a significant way then can it process and understand and plan human beings are really good compared to animals because we can plan in the future so can al can algorithms also plan in the future and give us the right recommendations and finally can it really act and act on those decisions and can we you know for example you know take a take a decision move um, robotics I and mean, basically can you act on the decisions and the last loop here is learn can you from you, when when you make a decision when you move when you do something you environment responds back to you and that is a source for learning error is a source for learning and you learn and you can get better and if an ai algorithm can do all these four things better or than human beings then the the combination of this could create singularity or superhuman intelligence that's really the power of ai and you're beginning to see that play out in a number of number of different ways and as we start using more and more ai in lots of different problems you will see that the cost of computing cost of ai cost of algorithms will keep coming down drastically dramatically over the next few few years it will then become ubiquitous because of having because its cost comes down and in fact many problems will be reframed as ai problems if you think of camp photography in the 60s and 50s it was about a chemistry problem because you would take a the black you know a pic a camera will take a picture then you have to put chemicals on it to to develop the negative and then you get pictures and print those pictures then it became a computing problem because compute computing became so cheap that digital camera photography came in it became a computing problem now it's going to become an ai problem because if you think of a google photos right now it's a massive ai algorithm helping you in sorting photos and doing a lots of different things and if you think of low light photography photography and other kinds of photography you'll start to see that ai algorithms will start to play a very important role problems get reframed as technologies become available now as that happens you are also seeing that ai is going to solve more and more complex problems on this axis here i on the x axis i have mission complexity the how complex or ambiguous a mission is and on the y axis is what is the data or the input complexity industrial revolution was very low mission complex low input complexity and next came the information revolution which was which was little more and in the last few years it's been the ai revolution pushing the boundary more and more complex mission more and more complex data sets and you're seeing that there is a space which is human realm which is this one in orange here but as you go there there are multiple applications for example ray dalio one of the success most successful hedge fund investors is trying to say when i retire can an algorithm take over and do my job Uh, he he is trying to do that here so you get you are seeing ai progress further and further in solving more and more complex mission but today if you go into the orange territory you see that complex the cost of implementing really skyrockets but that cost will keep coming down as ai becomes more and more powerful and you will see that it will start to play an increasingly important role in our lives and if you just think about the the productivity problem the last 50 years the world has grown because of employment growth not really as much, some productivity growth some employment growth in the next 50 years employment growth is going to be zero so we need productivity growth that's how gdp grows and if you have to grow the gdp by by let's say 3% for the next 50 years what is the productivity technology that we have today that's ai ai can also improve the human condition save traffic fatalities save millions of lives which are lost in hospitals because of human errors and even have the potential to alter the geoeconomic geopolitical balance of the world so ai will transform our world the question is 
Okay, how can we use AI to grow our business? I would have three formulas, three formulae for you in this, in this, uh, in the next ten minutes that I have. Number one is results. How can you drive AI results in your in your organization? First, you need not just smart algorithms. You need engineering and design. So I would say results is equal to AI into E squared into D squared. And let me explain what that means. Smart algorithms, but engineering wise, you need to connect the data pipelines that are in the, in your organization, and you have to automate and scale decisions in real time. Third, from a design standpoint, it's about not just solving a problem, but framing the right problem. If you don't know what the problem you're solving, you will not solve it really well by definition. Can you really bring in human algorithms, not just engineering, but also about user experience? So you need the combination of AI, engineering, and design to drive results at scale. Let me take an example of AI. In, in fractals, cure.ai, spelled as qure.ai, we are actually looking at radiology x-rays and seeing how can we reduce error rates. And we have shown tremendous progress. Even for, for COVID, we've been able to save tremendous amount of time in detecting the COVID cases using an algorithm. Similarly, you will see that uh, this cure.ai's algorithm actually takes 25 different abnormalities in an X-ray, right? It's very superior AI algorithms are being used to do that, which, so that it is actually equal to or better than doctors. Similarly, on engineering front, we've seen that if you actually, if you can actually harness all the IoT sensor data coming from various different sources in an industrial or manufacturing situation, you can actually prevent the faults from happening, prevent catastrophes, catastrophes from happening. You can actually detect defects and de de defects and solve for defects in, in 40 years, from 48 hours to real time. We have seen that in happening in big oil and gas companies because we have connected all the data pipelines, run anomaly detection algorithms because of which we're able to predict that something was going to go wrong and they prevent that from happening. So solid engineering is required in that, apart from the AI algorithm. Another example I will give you is that working with one of the largest consumer goods companies in the world, working with their retailer, we've seen that they have to ship their products to the retailer on time, not before time, not after time. It has to be exactly on time. Otherwise they get fined by this big retailer if, the, if you don't meet, meet those exact timelines when which your shipments have to reach them. Right? How can you improve the logistics accuracy and uh, you can actually use all the data coming from weather and traffic and, uh, and uh, you know, your own shipment performance and so on to make decisions on sending the right packages through the right delivery network so that it reaches exactly on time. They were paying $25 million in fines every year. We could bring that down by improving accuracy from 84% to 94% of their forecasting and the logistics algorithms. That's the power of automating those decisions in real time, which is the engineering dimension. Now let's look at the, de the design dimension. And design is not just about how things look and feel, right? It is about framing and solving the right problem. Let me give you an example of working with one of the largest health insurers in the world. We recognize the question was, can you figure out who is going to take their medicines on time? What kind of patients do not take their medicines on time? Think of a disease like diabetes or high blood pressure. Taking regular medication is one of the most important ways you can, you can prevent complications from happening, but not all patients take their drugs on time. When you start building the model for who's going to take their medicines on time, we realized that our algorithm was just as good as saying people who historically haven't taken medicines on time will continue to do so. We couldn't show a much better than that in terms of the algorithm. But what we did not see is that what if this problem is reframed? Some other firm uh, actually did that, and that firm was called PillPack. They said, it's not about predicting medication adherence, it's about improving medication adherence. How can you make it supremely easy by using of design to make it easy to, for patients to take their drugs on time? So what they did was they, they created this system called pill pack, where all your medicines are packed into this beautiful little uh, pouches and they just pop up and you just, all you have to do is tear open and take all the medicines. That one thing improves medication adherence. Amazon bought this company for a billion dollars in 2018, 2019. Uh, we've also seen this happening in driving adoption, let's say in, in, in Africa for, uh, for circumcision. We all know that circumcision reduces the chance of AIDS. But what, what happened was that in Africa, while 50 to 60 percent people are aware that circumcision is an important tool in reducing AIDS spread of AIDS, only 6 percent people end up accepting or doing the circumcision procedure because some of them have some barriers. So how can you remove those barriers from the understanding to action? So we actually created a system by which they can actually, you can see here, 
they can see the pain involved or the discomfort involved in each step of the process from day one to day day 15 or so from the time they decide to take, get the circumcision to back being back at work or whatever else and by giving them a visual reference for the pain we actually reduce the barriers to adoption and more it increase the voluntary circumcision rate by 35% by using design and behavioral sciences so i gave you one formula which is results is equal to ai into engineering squared into design squared if you want to reduce the error of ai algorithm and we don't have much time today to actually walk through that you need more data more compute and better techniques and sometimes you can balance them out if you don't have more data if you have more compute sometimes you can you can you can get similar results or if you have better techniques you can get better results but really it's about reducing the error rate or the improving the precision and accuracy of the algorithms i'm not going to talk much about that but the third dimension is about how do you as an organization improve the results you get from from ai and that is about talent multiplied by culture multiplied by governance and let me explain what that what i mean by that today it's about game changing talent in the world of ai in fast moving sectors like ai game changing talent is much better than the average talent if we look at sports we are very we are very aware that uh, in sports teams the best player gets 5 to 10 times as much as an average player right if you see here across sports you see that highest salary to the average salary is between 5 and 25x that's the range but in in firms in companies the best performer gets 30% more than the average performer or 50% more but not, or maybe double but not five times or 10 times or 15 times we have to get game changing talent because game changing talent is five to 10 times better than the average talent in this industry second is to create a culture an open culture from a culture standpoint you really want an open culture which has positive what is called a positive error culture do you celebrate error or do you punish error right for example in ray dalio's idea meritocracy culture what they do is the main best idea win not who produces the idea is it's about it's about the idea per se and the believability of the idea so they actually take feedback from every single person in any meeting on the ideas presented and therefore the most believable ideas as rated by others get selected that's a kind of a culture which is open transparent positive error culture right that's the kind of culture you need to succeed and finally and most importantly it's about being able to disrupt yourself right you can dis world is disrupting you in any case right but if you can disrupt yourself before the world disrupts you you can succeed so there is a core engine of your business which is already working you cannot disrupt it immediately like for example netflix had a dvd by mail service which was working really really well but they decided to start the internet streaming service and i as in the in the us i was i saw this and i thought why is netflix trying to disrupt itself the dvd by mail work is working fine that was 2000 mid 2000s by 2007 netflix is already consuming 30% of us bandwidth and then they started decided that it's not that's not enough i have to start my own shows in 2010 or 2011 they decided that no other people's shows my bargaining power is low may let me create my own shows they have continuously disrupted themselves to to be to be successful and how can you do that it is to actually create there is a core of your business but you have to take your new core you have to create a new core and that you have to keep keep it separate a separate part of your organization that can disrupt the core and once it is become strong enough bring you into the core that's what netflix is and that's what you need to do so if you bring in the right talent the right culture and bring the right governance you can actually drive results at scale thank you Hello. Hello. Can you hear me, sir? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much for the wonderful session, sir. Definitely the last points where you showed us how an organization can grow with the help of technology and culture is really something which everyone needs to incorporate in their system, because that's the requirement of today. So it was a truly enriching experience, sir. We hope to host you again and learn more from you. For now, we bring the session to a close. Thank you once again, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you sir.